But you've been, yeah. I mean, you've worked for the Dubai Prince, was it? Or the King? Um, well, I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Who knows if you've been there then? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Welcome to Marky Ready, Set, Go. This week, we've got an artist that has, he has hit every single medium. Music, graffiti, like just graffiti on paintings, in art. Yeah, it's, I can't describe what he does. But you just tried. I did try. He's like a paradox, <laughs> wrapped in an enigma. Let me welcome you to Paul Barlow. How you doing, well? I'm very well, thank you for having me. I know, listen, thank you for coming out. And I know you're a busy man and you do a lot, a lot of crazy stuff. Not so much now, but... You know, I've, I've done my fair share. Yeah. I mean, uh, right. Let's give everyone the grand tour of your life. Summarise the early years. The, the what got you into graffiti? Well, I think like a lot of people at my age, you know, mid fifties, they they were sort of waiting for something to happen because they'd been all sort of punk and mod and all that sort of stuff and BMXing and skateboarding, all them crazes. And then all of a sudden, the breakdancing craze arrived. And uh, me and my brother were watching Top of the Pops and we saw the Buffalo Gals video with Malcolm McLaren and we recorded it on our video recorder. And then that was pretty much it. You know, we we were uncontainable. We we saw it and we rewound it, rewound it, rewound it. And then the next day at school, everyone was talking about it. Everyone was either a break dancer or, or we didn't even know it was properly called graffiti or anything. But then it was like, we knew that that was break dancing and we saw the people doing scratching and it was just idiotic. So everyone at school on Friday was talking about it. And then on Saturday, me and my brother and a few other kids went to the local paint shop. They probably never lost a can of paint in the history of their, you know, of their business. All of a sudden, us load of little tow rags going there and just st stole nearly all the paint in one go. And then we went and did paintings like that first Saturday, straight after. And that was pretty much it. From then on, it was like a, a on-off love affair with... Did you know with tax? No, we, we actually didn't have proper names when we first started because the because of the influence of Buffalo Girls, what we saw was like proper paintings. So when we went out, the first time we went out, we actually did pieces and mine said break. It was like just a simple piece, but it said break. My favourite piece of all of your works, I know you did a lot of abstract stuff now, the one where the keys are dropping into the swimming pool. Oh, yeah. I know. Unbelievable. That was a, there's a funny story connected with that. It was, that was meant... That was made as a promotion for a big event in Tahiti that I was invited to. And the people came here to say, would you come to Tahiti? Of course I will. Yeah, no. And um, the deal was, was I had to do a promotional painting that that was then made into a video to promote their event. And then, um, you know, they would pay me and fly me to Tahiti, but they broke the deal. So that's why I've taken that off my social media if people are trying to find it. It's because it's got a bit of a bitter taste because... I, I was deported from America, so whenever I fly anywhere in the world, I cannot fly via the States. Really? Yeah, so if I go to Mexico or any of South America, I have to get a direct flight or I have to get a flight that goes either via Portugal or Spain. I can't go via America. I mean, but you've been, I mean, you've worked yeah. for the Dubai Prince, was it? Or the King? Um, well, I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about that. You're not, you have to, when you've signed an agreement, there's certain things that... Who knows if you've been there then? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But yeah, there's been all... I mean, I've been... You know, for someone that started off as a sort of, you know, working class kid, nothing special, you know, not real much expectation, you know, right where we lived, you were either, a, a, you know, a, a builder or a soldier or a mechanic. You know, that was basically... Or, or a butcher or worked in a shop. That was basically our choices, you know? And so for someone like that, you know, and I just went to a regular comprehensive school. I wasn't in any way academically gifted, you know, I just was, you know, meant to sort of be either a career criminal or be in the army or something like that. And I didn't want to do any of those things. I wanted to be an artist. So that was always an awkward situation. I mean, because you do music as well, don't you? Well, I, I collect, I've got a, a really mental record collection. I've been collecting records since that, which I know to some people would think, what are you talking about? But there's a reason for that as well, because... For me, I've got a form of synesthesia, which is whenever I look at paintings, they have a soundtrack. So if I look at something I think is incredible, I could go to an art gallery and look at a painting. I could hear what it sounds like. like it elicits sound. And when I listen to music, I, could, it, I just relax and it all just turns into pictures. So it's an amazing thing to have and it's really useful. And, you know, I could dip in and out of it depending on how much influence I want to take. So when I do my paintings... A lot of them, I don't really even feel like I do them. I just feel like, you know, I go into my studio, 
put the music on, and just go into the zone, and basically the paintings happen by themselves. That's why they look like they do. And I've got no people say, "Oh, do you design them?" And I'm like, "No, no, I don't design them. But they just happen." Because I mean, all the new stuff is all. I mean, it's all abstract, isn't it? There's Bentley that you've done a few times. Yeah, the, the, the Bentley and a McLaren um, Borsteiner. We did that, and then I've, I've done a series of Porsches. But at the moment, we're, the, there's something that I, you know, I'd love to talk about, but I can't talk about. But it's to do with that type of thing in a, in another country. And if that works, it would just it would just be yeah, of course that was supposed to happen. Do you, you know, there's a point of it. But I just often feel that if I talk about stuff too much. Kind of jinxes it. Oh, I respect that. Really, you know. But I mean, look, how about this? This is something we should talk about. Go on. You're many holidays away. Russia, Spain. Well, it's it's like, old. I, I was touching on it earlier, you know, like I was just a regular kid, but this was my expectation of my life. And then because I followed something that I was told not to do, the irony of that is, is I've ended up traveling the whole world, you know, doing graffiti, the thing I was told not to do. So yeah, I've been to Russia loads of times. I've been to... Korea, I've been to uh, Colombia, Brazil loads of times. You know, you name the country, I can say, yeah, I've been there. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's get, it gets that silly where I've been all over. I've been to America loads of times, you know, Mexico. I mean, I mean this list goes on. Didn't you work as a TV plan for a little bit in France, was it? The Skulls? No, I didn't. Well, I take, well that's interesting. Now, what that was, was I... I I was hired as an artist to be part of a TV show, and it was... Well, it's funny you should say that, actually, because what happened was the host and the presenter was too scared to go into the bit in the catacombs in Paris to, cr to create the programme they'd got to make. So I got sort of somehow enrolled into it. So I then had to become the presenter for one programme. So, yeah, that is true. But in a really weird way. So it's funny you should mention that. So yeah, by by accident, I was the host of a, a presenter of a of a TV and show. Thing in the, it's, just, the table. it's just funny that I just always think that if you approach everything with an open mind and you're nice to people, you have the ability to do whatever you want, really, and within reason. If you know, no limits, no. no. And I just think that you know, I'm I live sort of outside of society, but not in a negative way. You you're know? not a riot, but you live outside of the norm. Yeah, it's like. I don't agree with a lot of things at Dolan, you know, and I, I think that, you know, there should be much more harsher penalties for some things and more lenient ones for others. You know, I, I personally don't think that we should be forced into doing anything that we don't really want to do. And I think that we should live in a democracy, which we clearly don't, you know, but without being deeply political, it's like I live on the outside of society. I'm, you know, I'm a libertarian. I, I'm, well, everything you just said then is a libertarian's view. Is it? Well, maybe I'm one of them as well. I just didn't know what I want. Exactly. There we go. How exciting. I mean, right. I want to talk about some of your mad holidays, some of the things you've done when you're away. I like how you think of them as holidays, mate. They're like tours of duty. They're yeah. so stressful. Some of them were super stressful. Like, some of them were really funny. Like, I like to try to do unusual things. Like, in, uh, I mean, you're talking about weird places. In uh, 1999, I was hired to go to Romania to paint the opening title sequence of a TV show. So they had no spray, they had no graffiti in Romania, nothing. And they had no spray cans there. So me and the guy that organized it, because there was an English media company in Romania, we had to go to Holland on the ferry, pick up the paint and then get the tr pick all the, take all these uh, massive duffel bags of spray paint on a train all the way to Bucharest. <laughs> it's like that whole thing from Europe with these like giant duffel bags and when we got there we did this tv show and we were given an armed guard because the amount of money we were paid was english value money but in romania so it was like nearly a year's wages or more than a year's wages for a job that took one night so we had just bundles of money we didn't know what where to put it or everything it was absolutely nuts and uh, we had to have guards protecting us and what would happen was because there was no, they'd never seen graffiti before, we could do it wherever we wanted. So we did the job, and then we were like, well, that wall over there's pretty cool. And the people were like, yeah. <laughs> so we'd go out there and just do like some paintings on there, and then our guards would be standing next to us with guns protecting us. And then some other people would come, and there'd be a bit of a standoff, and no one knew who was in charge of what. So we were just able to do all this sort of weird graffiti. And then we met with some people that were local, and then we left a load of cans 
all the ones that were left over after the job for this guy called Earps. He then became like sort of the original godfather of graffiti in Romania. And he then had a guy that was learning and coming up under him called Emza, who is now one of the most infamous and greatest graffiti artists for the trains in the world, which I think is insane. So the genesis of the Romanian scene. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I can't claim anything, but I'm just saying it's interesting to be part of something, you know, knowing that the cans we left behind and the graffiti that we did there had such a, some people negative, and other people positive, you know. But again, you know, I went back and visited Emza years later and we did, we used to just do funny things like we wanted to try and do some concept graffiti, you know, rather than just doing regular boring stuff. So the Bucharest subway is this system and all the trains are covered in graffiti. It's really destroyed. So what we decided to do was we did this thing called the subway shuffle. You know, when you used to have a playlist on your iPod yeah. and put your iPod on the shuffle and you play whatever song in whatever order. What I did was I painted... In five days, I painted nine trains and painted nine different songs. So I did a painting relating to a song on each subway car. And then the idea was you go and sit in the station and then the metro system puts the songs on shuffle. <laughs> so you sit at the station and wait for which song's going to come next. And then the next train would come and you go, oh, sick, it's Lil Wayne. You know what I mean? And then, then it'd be the next song would come from Lil Wayne. It'd be a Ghostface Killer song or... You know, it's just stupid. I mean, Joe, I'm glad you want me to Because I've seen the... Because yeah, everything's connected, mate. Everything's connected. The night I met you, I met you at a New Year's Eve warehouse party. And I rolled over and I said, oh, I'm a huge fan. And you were doing micro spray painting. And we were at the... Do you remember the one in Hollingbury? At the... At the print work. The print work. Yeah. Not the sit as The one night rave. That was yeah. mental. I drank that green room dry. <laughs> oh. They weren't ready for me. Yeah, that was where my... The reason why I was at that was initially my studio was upstairs in there. Yeah, that's where yeah. Mass and Mass, that's where my studio was. Yeah, I really liked that. Can you remember the massive painting? Yeah. Yeah, that was, I was so impressed. I went in there, it's a jazz hunt thing. It, it, Paul hates this when I say this, but this is a real thing, right? I used to eat these celebrities for Sky, never cared. When I saw you, I beelined through your room and went, hello, mate. And oh, you were that's too sweet. And you were like, come the hell are you, bruv? I would never be so rude and precocious. That wouldn't have been me. I would have been lovely. And oh, yeah, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely, oh. lovely. But right, let's talk about the crime. If you like. Yeah. Victimless crime. Victimless crime. Well, you know, the corporate wallet feels no pain, does it? It really. I think it might have hurt them a little bit. Well, look, you know, if I would, I've never painted on anyone's house. I've never wrecked anyone. I've never painted on anyone's car. I've never painted on anything like that. You know, I only ever painted things owned by big companies, you know, or walls that no one cared about. Point Council, I saw that one. You took them on, and one. Yeah, but then I lost again uh, just before Christmas. I lost again there where I'd done a, a job for someone. And we it was basically sign writing, but those um, street officers, whatever they're called, you know, the ones with the camera, oh. I don't know what they're called. Yeah. They, no. they tried to arrest me, and then the police come. Uh, there was some mad thing and I got fined £500 for being at work for doing a sign that's was for a tattoo shop. Classic. Yeah, and then we appealed it and we lost the appeal <laughs> for the tattoo shop. That's pain is fine. It's not funny. It's dis it's disgraceful, really. But So I don't always win. I mean, do you know what? I've This is something I've noticed. Graffiti in the old days was on walls, done by people in the middle of the night. Yeah. A lot of it was bad. Then it transitioned. Well, we I think we changed a lot of that with... Mm -hmm. The broad daylight, just they, you know, the, the sheer audacity of what we were doing in Brighton, which was you just stand there in the middle of the day, maybe with a yellow vest on, you find a wall that's covered in tags, you stand there and paint it, then you paint a character or something that looks great and everyone loves it, and then you put letters in it as well. And then by the time you've finished, you know, you know, people start coming past and they see you're doing it all leisurely, you're not nervous. People stop you there. Oh, yeah, I'll have a coffee. Yeah, cool. Standing there having a coffee, chatting to the neighbours. Everyone's talking. So, of course, the the body language you're sending off is, why would this be a problem? Of course, it's not a problem. Everyone's cool. And if you give off that vibe, people will pass and go, oh, must be, must be some legal thing. Oh, it must be Banksy or some shit like that. Why? When people are, they just fall into it. It's like group hypnosis. My mum supposedly painted over a Banksy on Kensington Gardens 
Uh, she had she had number three Kensington Gardens. Well, you know you did all the side with, didn't you? I don't know which one's number seven. What else? No, no, no. You know where um, Kensington, Kensington Street, sorry. In yeah. White. That was you, wasn't it? Yeah, we did all the... That was, that was when we did a job for the council. And they we went to the meeting and they're going, oh, have you had experience of doing buildings before? And I was there with a couple of my pals. I was going, yeah, yeah, I've done loads of buildings. And they're going, oh, where are they? I said, oh, they're all in Europe. <laughs> like, I hadn't done any. I was just lying. And then they said, oh, you know, we're going to need a cherry picker. I'm like, yeah. They're going, have you got your license? You've been training them. And I tried to I've never done a minute's training in my life. And then on the first thing, it gave us the most astronomical amount of money. And we turned up to the first building with my friends. I was thinking, like, that's a big wall and they're like we're really laughing and we turned up a bit early before the council officials turn up and there's two council blokes with the cherry picker up so i turn up and go oh my god this is completely different to the ones i usually use <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they they give me a quick lesson so by the time the council got there i could use the machine and it was all good and then obviously they were the first section of the walls was a success and then they had good the hip hop chess pieces wasn't it yeah, well, yeah, th those were the, that was the section. So we did a big jungle one, we did a James Brown one, we did a Tone Pop. Yeah, based on Tron, we did, and then we did uh, the chessboard ones, and then we just did a whole sequence of other mental ones, you know. But they never gave us any. It, it, was it DMC with the kit? Yeah, Run DMC were in it, and then it had a few other different hip hop people, you know, that were all sort of, they were hip hop chess pieces, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, it was a bit of fun. Yeah. Uh, very, very good. Joe, I remember coming out like, and. That's uh, 18 years ago. 18 years ago, didn't you? Long time ago. My, uh, my mum was going mad at the graffiti. So the place was Rare Kind. Remember? Yeah, yeah. That that was that was Dad's from the graffiti crew Rare Kind that set up like an art gallery thing that then started having records in it. Uh, and the two things are fractured. They're still best friends, but Dad's has gone on to take Rare Kind to London and it's like an art agency. And then uh, Ewan has now got Rare Kind records, you know, at the bottom of Travel Stream. So it's it's all nice and positive, you know. It's all cool stuff. I mean, do you know this is something I think the underground art scene that is now mainstream, but began underground, in, especially in Brighton and Bristol, is fucking massive. Yeah, um, I mean, different places are really like Brighton Council and the Brighton at large should be disgusted with itself, basically, because Brighton, what was happening in Brighton about ten years ago, was world leading it was in front of everybody people around the world would look at what was happening in brighton in terms of what's the cutting edge of graffiti and then brighton council basically suffocated it and suffocated it and suffocated it then liverpool took over liverpool's got an incre incredibly strong and diverse open-minded approach to art socialist town socialist city then other mad places like south end leicester and um what's the other place and glasgow all got these super things like the events in Glasgow and South End are the biggest and best events I've ever seen. We get paid proper money to go there and do buildings and the whole place. They they put together a festival, right? So the whole middle of the town. So imagine outside Churchill Square, down Western Road, all that little, all cubed up with wooden things. And they'd give out a pamphlet, say, these are all the artists, you can check them off against their paintings. These are food stalls, here's music, here's everything. And there's hundreds of people doing art, and it's just full of families with their kids looking at art. And it's incredible. It's such a nice vibe, totally positive and creative. And it's all from graffiti, which is deemed negative and destructive. And you know, in Glasgow, beautiful. where I used to live just near, which was nuts. Yeah, the Young Works area. That, yeah. Down there. Like, I've got to go there again in May. It's one of the coolest things... So, there's a big thing though, isn't there? Because obviously, you know, there's a big connection between Ireland and um, Scotland. But in Ireland, there's a lot of graffiti. Isn't yeah, those who don't the Dable End murals, yeah. super important. I mean, obviously, it's, it's a hot potato to get involved in. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not a blind British person. If that gives you some sort of <laughs> tip of my allegiance, you know, it's like oh, I don't. I, I've always been of the great mind of. If you don't start at none, there won't be none, you know. So don't go other places and cause problems and expect no repercussion. Punch what do you want me to say? It's like yeah. difficult one, isn't it? I mean, do you know what? I think as well, a lot of people now look towards graffiti and the art in general to have a political spin on a lot of stuff. I was, we were talking about your daughter's art gallery and yeah. the massive success it is. Yeah. Check out Helm in Brighton. Now, there's lots of other little art galleries that have popped up and I went into one and it had a Johnny Depp. They wanted five thousand two hundred pounds for a Johnny Depp. It was one of two hundred and sixty ones. Yeah. And I just I said to the woman, and she was so proud she's got it. I just said, anyone can do that. It's, it's, it's easy. It's, I know obviously art is 
subjective to it, made by what it's done, what the history of it is. But also, this is just mass produced. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of mass produced art. I, you know, I've done a few prints even, and my prints never do more than, you know, I've never ever done more than fifty. And most of the runs of prints I do are around twenty because I, and I always hand embellish them. You know, I always do something on them because I, I've never been a great fan of these artists that come up with these ideas and then they have sort of millions to create it. And I just Mr. Brainwash. I'm not. I'm not poking. I'm not pointing at anybody. Being to suit <laughs> very unlikely. <laughs> but, but you understand what I'm saying, don't you? I think if you're buying something from somebody, and it's the artist, it's like you at least want them to have painted it or done on the paint. And I, that's look, it's touched it with a pencil. Yeah, I believe you, you should do it. So, you know, if there's a whole lot of things with this mass-produced art. It's not really my cup of tea. I'd rather, I'd rather have less available, but they're special. With that, we're going to take a little break to say thank you to our sponsors. We'll be back in just one second. Welcome back. And listen, big thanks to our sponsors. Looking after us. Go follow them. Go hit them up. Paul. Hi. There's so much to talk about. There is. You have so much going on. I want to get to the nitty gritty or the most exciting thing that has happened when we do graffiti. Well, on our illicit graffiti trips, like when we were going paying trains. Because, I mean, moving really tell us. I mean, it's important that I kind of caveat it a little bit by just explaining. It's like, when we would pay the trains, it wasn't like we were victimising anybody. It was celebrating a culture that was it sort of imported to us in the book Subway Art. You know, so when we first saw graffiti, it was all done on the New York subway trains. So to us, that is what real graffiti is. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's like a religious person following the Bible, a person that does graffiti follows subway art. In my mind, that's how it kind of works. So the focus for me was always painting. I loved painting trains. I absolutely love it. And I've painted thousands. I absolutely love it. But I don't do it to victimise anybody because the train companies, they've got big pockets. They make enough profit that doesn't actually damage the train. You know what I mean? The train can still move and work exactly the same. It's just got some paint rather than it being the live, the factory livery. It's got a different design on it. That's all affecting it happens. So it becomes it's up okay. axes. It could make the train more valuable or, or just more, 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 more yeah. Exactly. yeah. So it was never my goal to <laughs> disrupt anything or break anything. I just wanted to go in and get a trophy, you know, get my little trophies. And then get out, you know. So it became this thing of us going to different places all around the world to try to do as many different subway systems, you know. So it's like, you know, when you're on holiday and you're like in a mad country, like you're in, you know, like you're in Prague or something, and was, you go down into the subway and you just think, Jesus Christ, these tunnels are a bit grimy. And then the train comes trundling out of the dark and you think, well, I wonder where that's been. I wonder where that's going when I get off it. I can tell you, because we've, you know, like that, we've been down there tunnels. And, you know, we've painted things like that. But, you know, we would travel all around and then you'd find out which systems are really hard. And if you felt, like, ballsy enough, you'd go there and try them. Like, so, for example, we all wanted to do the Madrid subway because it was really difficult to do. So we all uh, flew to Barcelona, got the bus to Madrid, and a whole gang of us met up with these guys from Madrid we didn't really understand what they were telling us, how we were going to paint it, but they said, no, we're going to do it in the station in a minute. And we're like, yeah, but all the people are here. They go, no, no, don't worry. So they put two guys from their gang, got on the train, went to the next station, had a fake fist fight in the um, ticket office of the next station. So, of course, the security then go on the train to the next station. As the next train pulls in, the guy gets in the train, pulls the brakes, and the way the trains work there was the driver has to then get out of the cab, walk all the way down, work out which carriage the the brakes been pulled in, then he has to go with his key and then release the brakes so the train can move. So all the time he can't get to that brake, the train is stuck in the station, and that's what happens is you're standing in the station, they do this, and they say, come here, and all the people are sitting on the train, and all the people are on the platform, and you pay the train in front of everybody, and they say, You've got to shout, you've got to scream, you've got to shout at the top of your voice and everyone in the train won't move. And you're like, what? And they're going, you watch when it happens. So you're like, all right, whatever. Train comes in, rope gets in, 
Uh, 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 screaming and all this, everyone in the train just puts their head down like that, and we're standing there painting the train, you know, using cans, both hands, fill it in, paint the train in front of everybody. When the driver comes, they keep pushing him, won't let him get in the train, keep pushing him, pushing him away, blah, blah, blah. People trying to open the doors, they scream at them, push the doors back shut, and in about three or four minutes, which doesn't seem like a long time, but when you're doing something like that, it feels like a lifetime. You've painted this whole thing, painted it, outlined it, all done, and then you take the photographs, the bloke releases the thing, and then you think, right, how the hell are we going to get out of this station now? We're underground. Then they set all the fire alarms off, smash the fire alarm thing, every door all open the station but it opens, and you've got about 10 exits, and you just walk out into the street, and you're like, that was a rush. That, that, that was a rush, yeah. And then what happened was, you then get a taxi all the way around part of the town, and then... You stand at this bus stop and then the train you've just painted comes in overhead on a bridge and stops and you take them photographs of it. And then that night, they've got to put that train into the hangar to clean it. And then every time they do that, one of the trains that's supposed to be in the hangar is outside. <laughs> <laughs> what did they do? What my friend do? Not for them. You think know, this is idiotic. At which point are they not going to recognise that every time that gets painted, the one outside gets painted. But we did it anyway. Because we're idiots. I mean, I, I think this I think it's incredible. I mean, it was funny. Yes, uh, so have you ever been arrested? Yeah, I've been caught in a few places. I got caught in Poland, which was a very interesting situation. We went to a village to do a whole train. We were going to do six whole cars top to bottom. So the whole train would be completely painted. And we got caught before we started. And the cops knew what we were doing. But they couldn't. They couldn't prove it, but they couldn't do us for anything technically because we hadn't done anything. So all they could do was hold us all night. But what they did was they kind of made that as entertaining as possible by the, there were seven of us and they wouldn't unhandcuff us. And we were like all handcuffed together like in a big street. <laughs> and one of the two had his hand backwards in the handcuff and they wouldn't let him turn his hand around. So his hand was like that. So we kind of thought this was quite entertaining. So we're all connected together. It is funny. So some money in the toilet. <laughs> Yeah. So you're in this sort of room with iron bars with a toilet, someone needs a slash. Yeah. Well, like, middle, that must be horrible. I know, it's just the worst thing is, you ever felt the warmth of a man's wee on the back of your hand? Oh. When you're like, oh, like, that near his dick. You're just like, that is a level of intimacy with my friend, I don't know what. I call that Saturday night. <laughs> oh. Well, we were just grateful no one needed to sit down. That would have been worse. That would have been terrible. Yeah, but in the morning, all they could do was just like... They wouldn't let us go to sleep. They wouldn't let us do anything. So all they basically did was kept us all night and tortured us, like just running the truncheons along the bars, shouting at us, doing all this different shit, just being dicks. Because well, why, why would they take it so personally? Because they just thought, who the, who the fuck are these English people coming here doing this in like, in, in Poland in our village? So we were like, yeah, cool. So they held us until the morning. <laughs> they escorted us to the train station. We were like, we were like, all right. And then we just went back to our hotel. Nice. That was it. And then I got caught in Egypt. That was really interesting. Been in prison, in the water prison jail in Egypt. That was, that was actually the most interesting of all of them. But did I know you were in the jail? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was in Sharm El Sheikh. I don't know if I've been there going on. Like, yeah. Well, I've been in the jail there. It's pretty interesting. And you, know, you don't know who the police are and who the prisoners are. And there was someone doing It's really strange. They put you in this mad room. And it's got bars, but it's also got glass. But the, a lot of the glass have been smashed. And there was dudes that were handcuffed to the bars and they had blankets over them. So you were just like, oh, these guys. And their hands were just covered in mosquitoes. You're just thinking, bro, when you wake up, that's going to be grim, you know? Just simple things that annoy a Westerner. But you're in this room, there's maybe 20 people in there. And then someone would turn around and all of a sudden they'd have a gun in their belt. And you're like, oh, he's a cop and he's in here talking to someone. <laughs> and then you go back out of the room and you're like, anyone could have that mouth in. So you were thinking that was the, and it was, but it was super interesting. And it was like, did you ever get nervous getting arrested in other country? Yeah, that, at that time I was, I was, I was a bit. I mean, it, it ended up very funny, but at the beginning it was very nerve wracking because it was full guns in the face, get on the floor type shit. And then when they got me in the jail, I thought, oh, is this a hand chopping off place? I don't think it is. But when I sign in, I'm going to do it all left out of <laughs> If I'm going to lose my hand, it'll be the wrong one. Yeah. So I did, I did, I was mindful enough of that. So I kept my cool under pressure, did the left handed ta uh, signing in. Fortunately, he had the right thing of an 80 year old. What? He says, How is he an artist? But then when the main chief came in in the morning, 
he was just livid that there was an English bloke in the cell with everybody. And um, he's like, he, he took me in his room and he said, I'm really good English. He goes, what the fuck are you doing? I said, uh, do you got caught doing graffiti? He said, I'm not even denying it. I'm like, no, I got caught red-handed. You, your team were really good. They came from everywhere. I couldn't have got away. It was amazing. It's like very rarely really got caught like that. I've got to give them the credit. You know, they come out of everywhere. There's no way I could have got away. There's no point even running. They were everywhere with the guns out straight away. So I was like, right. and I'd done this massive wall on the side of the Sinai Desert right on the motorway. It's a really good spot, but not totally cool. And I just said to him, listen, if you want me to, I'll pay to have the wall cleaned or I'll go and clean it myself as a sense of sort of apology. I'll, I'll clean it. He's going, no, don't worry about it. He said, is it anti-Islamic? And I said, of course not. I said, nothing to do with that. He said, is it anti-government? I said, no. What what makes you think that? He said, oh, because we don't really have graffiti, so I don't understand what you're doing. I said, oh, have you got Google on your computer? He goes, of course I have. <laughs> so we go on then, Google what I do. And he just looks at me and goes, this is amazing. You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I am. He goes, so you've come all the way here to write, you, just write your name. And I'm like, He's going, but why? And I'm like, because I'm an idiot. And he goes, goes, yeah. And he just didn't, he couldn't get it in his head what the purpose was, which I thought was really kind of beautiful. You know, sort of a cultural sort of un... I mean, yeah, and I mean, that is the thing I should be. Yeah. And he was really cool. And in the end, he just said, look, I'm taking all the pain, but I want you just to go back to your hotel and reflect on what you've done. And when you leave here, I want you to always say that the police in Egypt were really cool. And I said, do you know what? That is a deal. There we go. You have fulfilled it right now. Yeah, you have been really good. And I've retold the story. And, you know, you see them, oh, you fucking police. Work. But they, they, they treated it like, like men. They treated me like a gentleman. They were cool. They kept their side. They were, they, once they realised it wasn't against anybody, they were just like, look, just go. You're an idiot. Well, when he did Russia as well, with the covering oh, man, and he got caught in Russia. That tram was experience. How did he not get caught in Russia? Well, there was eight of us went, and it was bad from the start when when we were doing the trains there. And when it came on top, I knew it was coming on top before it even came. And so me and the other guys ran, and then we all got in these cars. And as we went through the thing, we went through, and then another car came and cut off the car behind. So they called the people in the car behind. So it was Russian roulette. We were in the front car, so we got away. But the people in the back car. Why haven't they been through the all I know is they were in jail for about two uh, two or three days after that incident. That people ringing me go, you got to pay half the fine. I said, no, bro. I said, I ain't going to that fucking place anyway. You lot of toys, you fucking idiots. You made that go wrong. Not me. How did they make it go They would, they never took advice. They wanted to show off because I was a tourist, you know, from somewhere else. They wanted to say, oh yeah, we've gone and done this with the English guys, blah, blah, blah. But they would, th what they did was they put... Glory before common sense, which is the downfall of many hubris. Is that what that's called? Trial of fear. Fly too close to the sun, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely that type of shit. So the first place, it would be, it's, this could be kind of boring for anyone watching, but the first place we went to was really sensible. It had a bloke in a car that had fallen asleep and the train opposite him. And I said to them, this place is really good. It's on a curve. No one can see us. And if we all stand behind the wheels and have one person under the train watching the bloke sleep, we're cool. Because if he wakes up, he still won't see us because our legs are behind the wheels. You know? Yeah. So that was what I was saying. I was saying we'd do it here. And they'd go, no, no, this other place. And they drove us out into this industrial area outside of St. Petersburg. God knows, like an hour outside St. Petersburg. So, of course, if anything goes wrong there, how am I going to get away? Well, I'm stuck in a country that doesn't speak, they won't speak any English there. None of the writing's in English. I can't read anything because it's all the... The Cyrillic album, we get caught there. Yeah, who knows? But I've got to say, I have got mad love for Russia. It was one of the coolest, but I've been there four times. I absolutely love it. People are cool. You don't know them either. Yeah, you have to get caught. It's quite a complex thing. But one of the times I took my daughter, she was she was about... I liked her. So you drive there? Eight or nine? No, fly every time. You could you could drive there, but it'd be a bit of a mission. Because you take your daughter everywhere, don't you? I take her quite a lot of places, yeah. I've taken her to a lot of cool places, but... um. You know, took her to Russia because I just thought that would be a really positive thing for a young kid to do, you know. It's, yeah, cool. It's a really interesting place. Everything you read in the newspaper is not true. It's it's just a... a anyone who's been to Russia will tell you that. That's I true. mean, as a journalist, I can confirm that most of it is true. <laughs> oh, no, right, okay, yeah. From that point of view, but you understand what I'm saying. Why do you the truth? You understand what I'm saying? It's like, you know, the people are really warm. 
but it's a really cool place. You know, yeah. I, I've always had a really tough time. If someone re- messaged me now and said, we need you to do a job in Russia, I'd go there. I'd go there tomorrow. Where they follow me? Yeah. Wow. I mean, that is, that, that's really, you've been everywhere as well. I've been to a lot of places. I mean, you know, some of them are a bit sketchy. I mean, Saudi Arabia, I've been there eight times. Doing where that. where was sketchy? Saudi Arabia. <laughs> really? that, that's quite a sketchy place. And then, I mean, that's changed a lot since even when I first went there. But it's like now when they're doing all the big boxing events and all these different things, you know, they've kind of gentrified it at super rapid speed, which is amazing. I mean, do you know what? I'm involved with a company called 3X who are taking on the influence of boxing cards because the whole of boxing has just moved to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Everything, all the sports moved to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And they're trying to bring it back to the UK. Yeah. I mean, it's a very unusual place. But people, a lot of people get confused. They think Saudi Arabia is like Arab Emirates and it's not. So the poor people in Saudi Arabia, which you do have, there's a lot of them, and they're really poor. It's only really the relation, I don't want to say anything and not be able to go back to Saudi Arabia, but it's only really the people that are related to the royal family that get a leg up. Do yeah. you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, Whereas in, in Dubai and the Arab Emirates, it's like if you're born there, you automatically do all right, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I understand that. So it's like people that live in Littlehampton. They... Um... Listen, unless they're... Don't you go knock in LA, big city of ruins. Yeah, yeah, look at that. I mean, something special down there, you know what I mean? Nearly as bad as Bogna Rico. Oh, yeah, 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 Bogna Rico, yeah. Oh, I mean, we all love that. Big, big love to everyone from Bogna Regis. Yeah, yeah, you know, anyone watching from there, I mean, yeah, I suppose you might have it as an air connection. You know? Steady. <laughs> Steady, yeah. You start some into Sussex beef. Oh, come on. I mean, listen, I'm, I, I bought it every single town down the South Coast, you know what I mean? I was in London the other day, right? And I was looking at the thing in London. I know, I know, I was in London. And as I was going through it, I was looking at the quality of the work, and the majority of it is substandard to the sales coach. Controversial. But so there's a lot of big, good pieces, but a lot, yeah, the, a lot of the things are down to um, how, how much time you have to execute the paint in circumstances, you know, this type of stuff. So. It's like, and a lot of the, a lot of the youngers from certain places, they're not influenced by people that were, are perhaps so, so concerned with their output. You know, they're more about quantity over quality, which that's, I don't, if anyone really just, just listen to what I said, it's not a diss on anybody. I'm just talking about areas. You have certain areas where there's really high level quality graffiti painting and then you have other areas which are just swarmed in tags and neither's right or the better but they're just different i will pass piece of mills in brighton at the just when i'm milner flats right yeah in the yep. early station got yeah the piece must must be 10 meters high oh is it one of the horses galloping 10 meters high and what and 30 40 meters long yeah it, it is really big it's, it's that was a celebration of the fruit market and what was there before because originally it was stables in the middle of brighton and the lord of gentry used to be able to stable their horse in brighton if you were from london you'd say oh yes i'm keeping my horse in in brighton and then you you'd race it along the low tide or whatever you'd do i don't know but that's what they said on the cloth of billy yeah through the through the slime (laughs) your well section bees just snapped the tooth off yeah 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 I mean, do you know what? I because there's other bits. This is why I want to talk about the big bits because there's also you've done a lot of houses, didn't you? Well, that started as a bit of a joke. I mean, if you if you've got time for the stories, I think they're pretty funny. It started off as two landlords. Yes, time for two landlords with more money than sense trying to get one over on one another, and I became the lucky uh, recipient of the money to help facilitate that joke. So, what happened originally was two blokes went to the auction, bought houses like they would do every time there was auctions. One of them then went off to a foreign country and said to the other one, oh, can you make sure my house gets painted? The other bloke thinks, you so fuck all. Fuck, you got a roll of it. I've got... So he goes, all right, sweet. So he calls the maintenance guys that they use, find the worst moles you can, ended up painting the dude's house bright orange with purple trim. So it was horrific. So bloke rings up and goes, you've done my house. He goes, yeah, I've done it. <laughs> so when he sees it, he goes mental. Then when the other first bloke, the other bloke, Goes on holiday, he sends the team around to do an house paint. <laughs> so they start this thing. So then they're in the West Indies watching the cricket. This is how rich they are. And I get this mad phone call really early in the morning because of fucking knows what time it is. And they're all drunk and he goes, he goes, I'm sitting opposite him now. He looks like fucking Mark Simpson. He's going, I want you to stitch him up. You've got to go and meet Mac in the morning. I'll give you this amount of money. Bring loads of paint. Loads of yellow. <laughs> <laughs> this is my shit. I'm like, whatever. 
So I don't meet this bloke called back and he takes me to this house and he goes, yeah, you've got to paint a giant bar of Simpson in a in a you know, deck chair and a Homer Simpson with donuts flying all over the house. But on Elm Grove? Yeah, Bob was Elm Grove. Big fan. Hartington Road. We yeah. then became Bartington Road. Yep. So we painted this giant thing. The people in the house didn't even come out until we'd been there for about four or five hours. Then they come out and goes, what's happening? It's like, well, we've been hired by your landlord to paint your house. So anyway, we slaughter this whole house. Neighbours are going mental. Send, take them the photograph, send them to the bloke, send them to the other bloke. He's like, fucking live it. Like, I can't believe his house has been slaughtered. Then a neighbour climbs over the wall and writes, see you at tea across the middle of bar. <laughs> so then, uh, then they ring me and I say, do you want me to go back and fix it? They go, no, leave it there. Now, not only has he got bar symptoms, <laughs> but then we was going, look at that. Because we're not cleaning it up. And I don't know who in the end climbed in the garden, but someone climbed in the garden and squared off some of the lettering in the middle, you know, to get rid of it. But it's just stupid. And then the bloke goes, right. When they come back, like the first, the guy who had the bar on his house goes, right, I think you should go to number 60 whatever, up of Iadup Road. That's it. He's having it. I want this on his house. <laughs> so he's got so up and that. And then the other one rings me and goes, right. I want the most childish cartoon you could think of on his house. So then I kept meeting this math bloke. He kept turning up with this clown with these big ladders, like painted Adventure Time on one bloke's house. Then I painted Mac and the Up and Earth Road, Up and Earth Road. Then I painted Rick and Morty across the front of the house. Up and Earth Road. Then I had to paint one of them painted pink floor. I had to paint the, the brick in the wall. <laughs> with the hammers. <laughs> you just think. These people are so petty, but it was amazing. I mean, hilarious. So, yeah, this hilarious joke but that's happening in public, and I love that. Because you did the Beastie Boys Tale of a Plane. Yeah. But I got and that. Yeah, I got to do that because I was doing the house opposite on another wind up when I was painting. They were laughing, so they had a family guy with the big bombs oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. above the door. So that everyone had to walk underneath Peter Griffin. Is that his name, Peter? Yeah, Peter Griffin. Yeah, had to walk under his chin. So it's like as you look up at your. I thought he called shit. There, but I mean, you smashed it. That was, it was just funny, wasn't it? And then yeah. the guy opposite was like, oh, do you want to paint my house? Not realising that this was all like some running joke. And I'm like, yeah, sure. He goes, you can paint whatever you want. So that's when I then painted the tail of the Beastie Boys playing and wrote my name on it. Yeah. So that's how I did that one. And then all of the houses that we were doing, the wind-ups came to an end. <laughs> when Nigel, who's the, I think the funniest one, he asked me to go and paint Ronald McDonald leaning like straddling over the front door leaning between the upstairs and downstairs window being sick <laughs> so it's the house and the neighbors are coming out going yeah joking on yeah and i'm like what they go this ain't serious is it and i'm like yeah and i just kind of made this great big ronald mcdonald like throwing up all over someone's house that lasted a day I did that last well, yeah, didn't, I didn't even bother getting photographs. I knew from the mood of the neighbours that the neighbours were going to paint over it. So who painted over it, I don't know. But... I mean, look, we're coming near the end, but yeah, there's one bit I want to get about. Sell out shows. shows. How do people find you? Well, the best way to follow me is Instagram. So if it's arrow underscore heavy artillery, arrow underscore heavy artillery. Just A-R-E-O. No. I'm only dyslexic, not job. Oh, Arrow, A R O E. I'm oh, sorry, it's yeah. Spelt, it's spelt like phonetically because I can't have two R's and another year's horrible. Yeah. So, yeah, if you go on there and, um, uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff is promoted all over social media. So you can find stuff like that. I'm currently working with a French gallery and we're going to do a massive show in September in Cannes. So that'll be my next proper big show. But there's all sorts of different things going on before that. And I've currently got some work in the Helm Gallery if people are interested in that sort of stuff. And your, your show always set out there then? Yeah. And also, they're, they're more, it's a little bit more technical than the normal graffiti show. You know, people will turn up and expect to see, like, all of the all of the canvases I do basically take all the things I've learned from graffiti. So to do with, you know, um, contrast. Um, texture? Yeah. And, yeah, it's definitely texture and sort of um composition and all these different things and it's like i'll do loads of tags then clean them off then do more tags and clean that off and then do something neat then ruin it and then clean it and then you sort of end up with all these layers and then they look like a thousand layers of graffiti but done in a way that looks beautiful so when you look at it it doesn't look like graffiti but technically that's all it is it's only graffiti nothing else then they have glow in the dark layers then they have 
Um, also, they have augmented reality embedded in them. So when you go to take a photograph, it asks you if you want to take a photograph, you want to scan. And if you press scan, the whole painting comes to life and turns into an animation. Awesome. So it's a little bit more than normal graffiti. So, you know, there is actually a reason why I'm here talking to Mark. It's not just like I'm one of his mates. Um, the deterrent doesn't love crime and people suffering. Well, I don't really do it. It was a crime, but I don't really consider myself a criminal. No. I'm like, you know, I'm like John Bon Jovi. I'm not like, living on a crap. <laughs> I'm a steel horse I ride. Yeah, instead of alive or whatever it is. No, I'm, not. I'm more like Kurt Russell. Yeah, nice. You know. Big trouble in China. But no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of vibe. Snake Plissken. Baddie, but you love him. Baddie, lovable rogue. That's it. Lovable rogue. Well, it's important. Gentleman criminal. Thank you so much. No problem, brother. Okay. We will catch you guys next week.